Yeah, go ahead and take your seats. I want to welcome everybody to Rotary and the second of three debates hosted by Club 21. A special thank you to our friends at KXLY who are with us again live broadcasting today's meeting. Uh, for those in person or tuning in uh, that are unfamiliar with what a Rotary Club is or what we do, Rotary is an international organization that champions health, education, and peace through fellowship and service using our resources to make our community and world a better place. Spokane Rotary Club 21 was established in 1911 and includes 200 plus leaders from the Spokane area who are dedicated to service above self. You can learn more about who we are, what we do, and how to get involved via Facebook, online at rotaryspokane.com, or contact our Rotary office, and we'd love to get you in touch with our membership develop committee, development committee to discuss if Rotary is right for you. Being a 100-year-old organization means that we have a few traditions to go through each meeting before we get to our program for the week. So don't worry. We plan to do these things as quickly as we can for you, and I hope I can stick to the script, Jenna. Okay, so first we'd like to thank our guests in the room for joining us today. If you're a guest, would you please stand and we'll just give you all a collective round of applause. Next, while we uh, will hold official birthday celebrations, that's a big deal for you guests. We like to celebrate our birthdays. Uh, for the following Rotarians, once our debate programs are concluded, we still want to wish a quick happy birthday to the following Rotarians this week. Paul Reed, Christine Brishley, Lisa Price, and Mike Church. So let's give them a round of applause and a happy birthday. Okay, and before we dive into the program, I'm going to remind you that next week we're going to wrap up our debate programs with a city council president debate. You still have one day to submit questions for that debate to the Rotary office and until Monday to RSVP. So please join us next week and make sure you RSVP. And now to uh, kick off today's debate is our uh, one and only uh, Gary Stokes. Would you please come on up? He is going to be our moderator for today. You should all feel very lucky that there's only one Gary Stokes. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's debate. As many of you know, Rotary Club 21 has a decades-long tradition of hosting political debates between candidates seeking public office. This has been done as a community service to help citizens make informed voting choices. Our debate today is with the candidates for Spokane Mayor, Nadine Woodward and Lisa Brown. Thank you both for participating. And now the boilerplate. Rotary 21 policies and procedures during debates are as follows. The candidates have signed a debate guidelines agreement outlining the code of conduct and agree to follow the Rotary Club 21 debate policies and procedures. Reuse of any portion of footage or images from this debate is strictly prohibited without the written consent of Rotary Club 21. Use of cameras and recording devices are not allowed during the debate other than by authorized media outlets our friends at KXLY who are taking care of us for that today, so thank you for that. And applause, or outward expressions of agreement or disagreement, are not allowed during the debate. We ask all Rotary members, guests, and campaigns to avoid negative social media during or after the debate. The debate questions are from Rotary 21 members, screened by the debate committee, and selected by the moderator. The questions have not been provided to the debate participants in advance. Time constraints may not allow all approved questions to be included in the debate. Now, prior to the debate, a coin flip determined the order of speaking for opening and closing statements. Nadine Woodward will now have the first opening statement and the first closing statement. Lisa Brown will be second in both of those. Each candidate will be given a one and a half minute opening statement and a one and a half minute closing statement. Following the opening, we will begin with debate questions, alternating who responds first for each question. The first responder will be given one and a half minutes, followed by a 45-second rebuttal. Our timekeeper, John Driscoll, will signal when 30 seconds remain in your response time, and a final signal when your time has ended. At that point, please complete your final sentence, and I will move to the next question. A time penalty may be assessed for not stopping on time. 
Each candidate has a one-minute wild card to use any time by notifying the moderator at the end of any segment. It may be used to clarify an issue or position or to extend your closing statement. The moderator may press for a more direct answer. And so now, before we begin, since this is your last chance to make any noise until after the closing statement, a round of applause to welcome our debaters. While they're coming up, I will give you quick bios. Meet the candidates. Mayor Nadine Woodward was elected to that position in 2019 after a 28-year on-air career, which included stints at both CREM and KXOI. Nadine worked her way through college, graduating from the University of Portland in 1985 with a Bachelor of Science degree. She served on student government, editor of the student newspaper, did video production work, and an award-winning member of the debate team. During her first term, Mayor Woodward's work with local, state, and federal community and governmental partners has brought together resources to prioritize community safety and wellness in a time of extreme division. She has embraced community expectations of support, accountability, and advancements with a practical and orderly approach that has drawn attention and support nationwide. Mayor Woodward. Thank you. Lisa Brown has been involved with Spokane since 1980 as an associate professor of economics at Eastern Washington University. Since then, Lisa has spent 20 years in the state legislature in the third legislative district and elected by her peers as Senate Minority Leader and the first Democratic woman to hold the position of Senate Majority Leader. Lisa also served as Chancellor of Washington State University's Spokane Health Sciences Campus and was part of the team that created the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine. Most recently, Lisa served as director for the Washington State Department of Commerce, where her work included small businesses and affordable housing development. Lisa Brown. As mentioned, uh, Mayor Woodward will have the first opening statement, followed by Lisa. All right. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, Rotary 21, for this very important debate today. Uh, I ran for mayor four years ago because I wanted to do great things for the city that I love. And we have made some sweeping accomplishments during historically challenging times in my first term. A health pandemic and a lockdown. Our advocacy convinced the governor to open the state by regional metrics, not statewide, as was first intended. Spokane County was the largest county to open first and to get our businesses back open. A summer of protests and our first riot. As a law and order mayor, I directed law enforcement to keep downtown safe and to protect our businesses. The police chief and I have also advocated at the state level to get tools back that were taken away by radical state policy from police, like the ability to pursue known criminals and suspects and tougher boundaries to get drug addicts into treatment and to ban drug use in public spaces. A housing crisis. My administration was a leader in our work to offer flexibility on all residential lots. Unanimously passed by council, we've had record permitting because of that. And unprecedented workforce shortages. We've invested in our employees to continue to provide the highest level of services that you, our customers, expect. I am proud of our record of bringing this community together to accomplish real results. Our work is not done. My challenger is supported by anti-police activists. She opposes Measure 1 to fund a new criminal justice center and supports homeless programs that don't require accountability, such as so-called safe parking lots. Thank you. Lisa Brown. Thank you, President Rod and fellow Rotarians for hosting this conversation. Thank you everyone attending or watching for caring about the future of our community. Mayor Woodward, thank you for your public service. I'm Lisa Brown and I'm running for mayor to bring people and resources together and get things done for Spokane. I have a strong record of listening to people and their ideas and whether it's the Fox Theater or Crosswalk for Street Youth, cleaning up the river, or the WSU Medical School, or Small Business Resiliency Fund when I was at Commerce, uh, that record is what I'm running on today. 
my leadership skills and economics background and my knowledge of state and federal resources will be good for Spokane. We'll make real progress on the challenges we're facing in public safety, homelessness, affordable housing, and the economic insecurity that affects one in three Spokane households. Four years ago, my opponent campaigned on finding solutions to homelessness and public safety. Can anyone say that we're doing better on either of those issues? I've knocked on doors from five miles five mile to Southgate. I can tell you with confidence that the answer is no. The city has been full of turnover, division, and we have a looming budget crisis. There's a better way, and we can get there with experienced collaborative leadership that I will bring to the office of mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Lisa, we will start with you. What do you think makes a successful mayor? I think a successful mayor, as I just said, is about experience, collaboration, bringing people and organizations and their ideas together. Uh, we've got great neighborhood councils in Spokane. We have uh, assets in our nonprofit community and in our business community. Where we have lacked is in the ability to pull people together, find that common ground. I think that's what leadership is all about find the common ground and move people together. I also think for a city like Spokane, which is economically challenged, knowing where the state and federal resources are and how to bring them to bear in our city is really an important quality for the mayor. I also believe that a mayor has to be someone who has deep knowledge of the community. I certainly have that from my years of experience. And you all gave me a crash course in Spokane when you contacted me over the years when I was in the legislature or at Commerce and came up with things that you said we could do together and do better. I listened to those things. The WSU Medical School was not my vision. It was the vision of business leaders before me. But I helped get the job done. And I think that's the type of mayor that Spokane deserves. Thank you. Mayor Woodward. Thank you, Gary. Um, I didn't come from a place of politics when I took this position and ran for, for mayor of Spokane. Um, and I don't think that any career politician or veteran uh, could have led this city any better during the unprecedented challenges of the last uh, four years. Uh, I think mayors who are successful are the ones that bring everybody together. Uh, we have done that to face all of the challenges. We kept the unhoused in shelters during COVID. We advocated collectively for our county to open up businesses. Uh, I am a mayor who listens to everybody. I came from a place where for 35 years I was a journalist and I did my job by listening. I always say when you listen, you learn. When you speak, you repeat what you already know. And I represent everybody. And I know that as mayor, that's my job. Thank you. Mayor Woodward, are there areas you'd like to improve or enhance if elected? Will we be doing rebuttals? Just a question. Sure, go ahead. Is that yeah, that's okay? Fine. All right. So, uh, my rebuttal is that experience does matter in leadership, and uh, having experience doing hard things matters. And I have that at the WSU uh, campus when I was chancellor. They said you can't get another medical school approved, but I helped do that in a bipartisan way. And I led an organization during the pandemic as well. And it was challenging, but the legislature had such confidence in our work that they, they uh, ended up having lots of federal and state funds come through commerce. And we transitioned to all the challenges of that pandemic. And I think that that really is a very key difference between us, that I do believe my experience will make a difference and help us move Spokane forward. Can I get some clarity, um, Gary? So we're going to have rebuttals for each one. I would hope not, but I have a feeling this is going to <laughs> because happen we have anyway. a because we have a wild card too, yes. so yes. that we use once. So yes. I'm just so wondering. Please go ahead. Uh, no, I don't need to rebut her okay. rebuttal, but right. I'm just wondering moving forward if that's how we're the format. Again, <laughs> I would hope not, but okay. we will continue on. Thank you. Uh, how would you describe your leadership style, Mayor Woodward? That's the next question? Okay, yes. I thought it was um, improving things. Uh, well, leadership style. Uh, my leadership style is, is listening to everybody. As, as I mentioned, I, I meet with people as mayor and CEO of a 2,300-member organization uh, and, and as, as the mayor of the city of Spokane, second largest city in the state. My job is to listen to everybody, people that I like, 
people that I don't necessarily get along with, people that I agree with, people that I don't agree with. I represent people who voted for me and didn't vote for me. So my leadership style, as, as anybody also on my kitchen cabinet will tell you, that I want diverse ideas. I want to be challenged in my way of thinking. I want lots of choices so I can make great decisions in how we address some of our challenges, certainly public safety, uh, housing, homelessness, uh, economic development, re pandemic recovery, all of those things. And so I um, empower my cabinet members and, and staff members in the organization to lead, to be innovative, to be creative. Uh, as, as my challenger mentioned, we, we do have a, a budget gap, uh, in, in a structural gap in our budget. And we are finding efficiencies, we're getting creative, we're getting innovative. I mean, this is inflationary times. We're not the only city experiencing a structural gap. I'm sure some of your businesses are experiencing the same thing. We'll get through this. I, I have to provide a balanced budget as required by law, and we will. We're going to have to make some tough choices. But um, listening and involving everyone possible is, is how I lead. Lisa? Uh, my leadership style is collaborative, and I have evidence of that. When I was in the state Senate, uh, despite opposition within my own party, I sponsored with a Senate Republican the state's rainy day fund constitutional amendment, and we got that done. My leadership style is uh, bringing people who have been historically marginalized into the process and helping them have a seat at the table and participate in the decisions. And I believe in transparency. I will work very transparently with the city council, no matter who is elected, with the neighborhood councils, and with the public to take on these challenges together. Thank you. Mayor Woodward, let's uh, move over to housing and the homeless. We're hearing a lot of rhetoric on homelessness. Without pointing out the shortcomings of your opponent, please explain your short-term and long-term solutions for homelessness, and how would we pay for it? Well, that's, that's a huge challenge. That's one of the biggest challenges that we face, just like other cities like Spokane. Um, we, as uh, under my direction, have increased capacity within our regional shelter system. We kept, as I mentioned, the unhoused housed during the pandemic when there wouldn't normally be a city-operated shelter for that. Um, as we've increased capacity, a low barrier so that we can enforce sit and lie and camping throughout our city and certainly downtown, um, we opened up the biggest shelter that Eastern Washington has seen, our Trent Resource and Assistance Center. It houses 300 people on any given night, 300 people who would be off the street with wraparound services for mental health treatment and addiction treatment. We're going to start virtual court so people can resolve criminal justice uh, issues in their past so they can move forward as they exit homelessness. It's not cheap. It's very expensive. But one of the things that um, I'm also joining as a city is other states, other cities in the state and other cities in other states to compel the Supreme Court to overturn Ro uh, Martin v. Boise and Johnson versus Grants Pass because it has shaped, reshaped how we address homelessness. We cannot think that we have to have a shelter bed for every single homeless person that there is. We need to better use our capacity in moving people through the system. Our funding is all grant money, state and federal, and it is not sustainable. We don't have sustainable funding for homelessness, and that's an issue. Lisa. Uh, I believe in a regional model. I will work with other local governments to uh, work together. I believe in a navigation center model where you have coordinated intake, you have all the organizations within a system, and you're able to monitor people by name, what resources they got, and what uh, actions uh, resulted. I believe in a street medicine model where we can free up law enforcement by putting more licensed mental health professionals into our homelessness outreach. And I believe in bringing people inside, not having them camping, and I think we can do that by uh, working with the community to create more emergency places for people to be. Gary, can I add something on uh, a rebuttal? And this is just in, a, in addition. Um, I have led the year-long effort to um, create a regional homeless authority or collaborative. We went to Houston. We saw how that city, the fourth largest city in the country, has reduced homelessness. My Trent uh, Resource and Assistance Center operates like a navigation center with those wraparound services. And uh, I firmly believe that homelessness is not just a city of Spokane issue, although the city responses 
of this issue for the entire region. But we have brought cities within the, in the county together to, to be able to create this authority so that we can better coordinate the resources and the spending that we have because we have to have better outcomes. We are spending more on this issue and it's only getting worse. We have to do something different and I think the regional model is the way to go. Thank you. Can I just clarify the structure? It's question, shorter, response, and we, ha then we have a timekeeper, and he is keeping the time. But then you go back, and then the next question, it would be me, and I would get the longer response. I'm just trying. I, I watched the jail debate last week, and I was just question, response, and rebuttal is how they did it. So I'm just trying to get used to the format. That's fine. In that case, then, the next question is yours, okay. and we will we'll take it from there. The city leases the trench shelter from a private developer. The city is essentially a warehouse and costing the city millions of dollars. Do you believe this facility continues to be a viable option for addressing the needs of the homeless? If not, what should the city do? I, I believe the trench shelter was the biggest single mistake uh, of this administration, and I do not think it's an adequate facility uh, for the unhoused population. I think it's been a money pit. Um, the first operator was uh, revealed a year ago to have fraudulently uh, misused resources. The mayor promised we would get a uh, response on that, and we still don't know how much money was defrauded from the taxpayers and what happened to it. Um, what if you had a landlord and they said, lease this facility, oh, you get to put in the bathrooms and running water. That's the deal that the mayor made uh, with Larry Stone, and it wasn't good for taxpayers, and it's not good for the unhoused population. Uh, we can do better. Um, the city owns a facility called Cannon Street, and it's closed. So there are ways to create a more dispersed model, certainly not hundreds of people in one location, and actually uh, utilize Spokane taxpayers' dollars more effectively and efficiently. The Trent Shelter is not a navigation center model. A navigation center model brings all the coordinators together, and no matter where you enter the system or where you get placed, Family Promise um, or the Hope House, uh, there is one set of metrics for looking at what uh, resources people were offered and what the outcomes were. And this will be better for the public to understand exactly where our resources are going and what kinds of outcomes we're getting. Trent brings in 300 plus people every single night and off the street. Um, it is operated by Salvation Army. Our findings into the former operators of Guardians found no city dollars were misused. It was an IRS issue that they had had with federal dollars not going through the city. Um, it is a navigation center with wraparound services on site. I'm not sure why Lisa keeps saying it's not. And if it's a money pit, then why is Commerce funding it? Thank you for the money, Commerce. And, um, and if it's such a bad idea, then why are Lisa's two biggest allies, Julie Garcia, and Ben Stuckert vying to operate it in 2024. Rebuttal. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, there are over 2,000 unhoused people in the streets of Spokane and only 1,000 emergency shelter beds. So the fact that there are people there doesn't mean that it's an appropriate place for those people to be. It means that there are not other places to go. Uh, second, uh, commerce-funded requests by uh, the mayor and uh, shelter beds were one of those also at Hope House and other places just because those requests were funded again doesn't make it an appropriate place for people to go and um, the Trent shelter is not funded next year in the city budget and there isn't a, an operator for it next year in the city budget there's a process that hasn't even been completed and I don't think that the mayor can tell us how in fact it will be funded next year. I have to correct something that we did do an RFP process for an operator for 2024 and one was suggested so that work has been done we have uh, identified funding through the first half of next year which is only what the council wants to fund and it was our council president, our former council president um, Brian Beggs who shut Cannon down. It wasn't me. Thank you. Next question. Do you support the ballot measure criminalizing homeless camping? Will it push homeless camps into neighborhoods and along the river? Are you talking about Prop 1? Yes. 
Prop 1 is going to be on the November ballot. Um, Lisa's allies try to get it off the ballot. Uh, it would ban homeless camping 1,000 feet from schools, daycares, and parks. And uh, this is a no-brainer. This is common sense. Listen, we, we, we looked at what Camp Hope did for 18 months, 1,000 feet from Libby School. And those parents of those children were terrified when their kids went to school every single day. The city paid for overtime police officers to escort those kids to and from school Monday through Friday. Um, I absolutely don't want homeless camping next to parks and schools and licensed daycares. And I think this is a common sense approach. Uh, and, I, and I just, I, I don't know where the common sense is anymore, to be honest with you. People who are going against this hired a lawyer to keep you, the voters, from deciding if this is what you want for your city and for your neighborhoods and for your families. I, I don't understand that. But yes, I absolutely support this. Yeah, this ordinance is definitely going to pass. I've been talking to neighbors, and they're frustrated. They're frustrated because we haven't made progress the last four years on the issue the mayor ran on. But camping, telling people where they can't camp, is not a solution. If you move them from one place, they will move to another. People can tell you that right now in Hilliard, um, in Brown's Edition, uh, by, in neighborhoods by the river. Um, nobody wants people camping by parks or schools or parking lots. Part of the solution has to be to expand our homeless outreach and create places where people can be uh, navigated to. Using peer navigators who have gotten through homeless and addiction has been shown in other cities to be an effective approach. Thank you. Let's move on to economic development. Are there industries you'd like to attract to our city? Absolutely. Uh, one of our strengths is a diverse economy, and this is an area that I've worked on for 30 years. We have an aerospace sector, and we are potentially on the verge of federal funding uh, through the Chips and Science Act, and I worked with Senator Cantwell and the folks at Gonzaga who put together that proposal. We have a creative economy, and I sponsored the film and, uh, Tax Incentive, and we have a movie studio now in Airway Heights, and creatives uh, want to stay in Spokane, whether they're in arts or music or in film or theater. We have a health sciences economy, and this was a dream of people before I moved to Spokane, but I helped make it happen with the university district buildings, the lab coats, and uh, the classrooms that you see in the university district building, which is part of an amazing future for Spokane where we actually have two medical schools that admit students here, and we have research happening that's spinning off into new health benefits. Uh, so now we need to work on workforce development so that our uh, young people can both uh, get that post-secondary education they need, whether it's in the trades or whether it's on path to being the first doctor in their family. And if we do that right, Spokane's future is very, very bright. One other area we need to work on is our kindergarten readiness. Our zero to five kids are not getting what they need. Only 30% of them are ready for kindergarten when they get there. So I will be bringing forward an initiative with the school district in that arena as well. Mayor Woodward. Well, I'm very excited uh, for economic development opportunities within our city and certainly within our region. As I said, we advocated to keep businesses open during the pandemic and just to offer pandemic recovery support for them. Um, I have partnered with uh, my administration, with Small Business Administration and AHANA to support minority-owned businesses to get help them start up and also expand. I am part of um, a hub tech project with WSU to, to create a, a, a tech hub for the uh, region. We would be number one in the region if we get this grant to start making that happen. Many, many opportunities there. Um, broadband results, we have a broadband PDA, where we are uh, leveraging what we have put down in our city and offering rural broadband uh, so people can have economic development uh, opportunities there. Rebuttal. Go ahead. Uh, uh, point of privilege for the floor. I'm going to be reading rules from the debate. Number five, following, the moderator will begin offering debate questions. 
The moderator will alternate and gives the first response for each question. Then the first responder will be given one and a half minutes to answer, followed by a 40 sec 45 second rebuttal from the other candidate, at which point we will move on. If you'd like, each candidate gets a one minute wild card to use any time by notifying the moderator at the end of any segment. It may also be used to extend your closing statement or to clarify an issue or a position. Are the rules of the debate clear going forward? Thank you, yes. Thank you. How do we support? How do we support small businesses in our city? Uh, Is that to be? Yes. So, uh, small businesses in our city are best supported uh, by bringing them to the table and asking them what they need for that support. When I was at Commerce, uh, we founded the Small Business Resiliency Network, and that brought funding to AHANA, to the INBA, which represents LGBTQ businesses, and to SIMBA, which represents local independent businesses. And small businesses are also supported by doing the essential work on public safety and uh, bringing unhoused people inside that makes for a safer environment for those business districts, whether it is downtown or the Garland or Perry Street. It's one of the strengths of Spokane that we have these small business districts dispersed throughout our community, that they're, bi they're bikeable and walkable. And so in some ways what they need is the same thing that everybody else needs, and that's progress on these key issues of public safety and our unhoused population as well as um, a city that uh, city administration that knows how to um, work with state and federal resources uh, to make good things happen for the community. Mayor Woodward. We have a thriving business community. Our downtown, Spokane's downtown, is the economic engine of our entire region. And the best thing the government can do for small business is get out of the way. We have a very high regulatory environment that makes it very difficult for businesses to operate. Uh, my, my challenger, her tax and spend policies in Olympia increased taxes. She sued the voters to raise taxes. She supports an income tax statewide. Those are all things that aren't good for our, our, uh, our businesses. But public safety is number one. I mean, we're not going to have economic development or strong businesses unless we have public safety. And um, bad state policy has left um, problems on our sidewalks, problems on our streets, problems in front of businesses that the police chief and I have been fighting uh, since I've been in office. Mayor Woodward, many corridors such as Division have vacant and underutilized properties. How do we revitalize those areas? Well, one of the things as far as a housing crisis that we're facing um, is to convert vacant buildings, especially in our downtown area, to convert those into residential. Um, also on the, on the vein of how do you support small business and especially a, a, a healthy downtown. If you have more people living downtown, you have a healthier, more thriving downtown. You've got people who are supporting small business three times the level that people working downtown Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 do. Um, so there are many, many opportunities that I think we have. Uh, we need housing. And if we can uh, increase density within those spaces that you're talking about to support businesses, to offer more residential units, we absolutely need to do that. Well, uh, I have three ideas about that. One is I think we use our public development authorities. We can't, the city can't turn over property to those public development authorities, and we have those in the Northeast and the University District, and uh, we can make better use of those. I think a land trust model is something we should explore, where you make the uh, land, um, uh, is, the city makes the land available to the developer upon the condition that it's affordable housing or a, a beneficial, beneficial public use going forward for multiple um, years. And I think we need code enforcement to take on those zombie properties and then work with our financial institutions to get those converted in, into productive either housing or retail um, activity. Next question. Do you think Greater Spokane Incorporated is effective at attracting new businesses to our community? 
And do you believe, do you think the city needs its own economic development office to better attract and retain business? I think that Greater Spokane Incorporated has done a, a great job over the years. I'm proud that I worked closely with Rich Hadley uh, when GSI started to create a unified agenda and came to Olympia with that unified agenda, and we were able to really accomplish some great things because of that. Uh, I also worked with GSI when I was at Commerce. They would recommend projects for the Strategic Reserve Fund, which I sponsored when I was in the legislature, and I had the pleasure of recommending to the governor that those projects be funded here in Spokane. So Carbon Quest in the Valley, um, Aerospace, Aeroflight in, um, in the West Plains, those were projects that GSI worked together with the business, received the funding from the state, and then wrote the contract with the business to create jobs here in Spokane. So I do believe that the city uh, needs to be actively involved in economic development, and I will have someone, if I'm mayor, working with me and for me who is involved in economic development, partnering not only with GSI, but with the other economic development entities in this community, and there are several. Thank you, Gary. I think GSI is doing a great job, and under Alicia Benson is um, doing doing very, very well. Uh, I'm a member. I'm on their board. Um, they do uh, what they can to attract new business, to expand business, and to diversify <clears throat> the types of businesses that we have. Uh, during the pandemic, I stood up a community economic development division in the city of Spokane. We have an economic development director. I hired Steve McDonald out of L.A. His son had graduated from school here, stayed here, and he's doing an excellent job. He's doing everything that you would want an economic development director to do, and uh, he is expanding opportunities for the city of Spokane and for our entire region through his work. So, yes. Mayor Woodward, uh, this is from one of our members. I respect and appreciate your foundation of faith, but why would you get on the same stage as Matt Shea and let him pray over you? And who in your campaign did you fire for letting you do that? And what was the last part of that question? Who in your campaign did you fire for letting you do that? Well, that was me. So, and I'm not going anywhere. Um, <laughs> I was invited by a friend to attend a prayer service. And uh, six days before the event. And I didn't ask enough questions. If I had known Matt Shea was going to be there, I wouldn't have gone. I had never met him before that night. I had spent that day... Uh, meeting with families impacted by the fires in Medical Lake and Elk. And I called my friend who had invited me and said, listen, I know you're going to pray for the city and you want the mayor there, but please, please, we need to focus that prayer on people who are hurting, people who have lost their homes. I had spent day with talking with those families at the evacuation center, incident command. I said, we need prayer for families. 350 people have lost their homes. And so when I got up there, when I got there, I had no idea who was going to be praying over me. I knew it was a, a faith community members, 4,000 members were going to be there praying for all parts of the city. Um, and that they wanted me there when they prayed for the city. So I walked up on stage and saw Matt Shea there. You think I'm going to walk off that stage? There were 4,000 people at that service, at a prayer service, and our city needed prayer. I wasn't there for Matt Shea. And because I spent 90 seconds on a stage with him, exercising my religious right to pray for my city that I love, his ideology then doesn't become my ideology. And let me just tell you, as a mayor of this city, I represent everybody. Like I said, people who agree with me, people I don't agree with. That's my job. Lisa? Uh, my statement um, immediately after uh, the event and was that it was a poor decision uh, to attend the event that, that had been publicly. I certainly knew that it was coming to Spokane and had read about it in our local press and that it was a poor decision to, to go on the stage and publicly associate with Matt Shea and associate our city with him. And the mayor has admitted that it was a mistake and I think we should, we should move on. Thank you. All right, and so now we're at the point where each candidate gets to ask a question to their opponent. And so we're going to start with Nadine's to Lisa. Proposition 1 on the ballot this November puts restrictions on homeless encampments within 1,000 feet of schools, parks, and children's facilities. Many of Lisa Brown's supporters are on record as opposing this proposition. Lisa Brown, do you support Proposition 1? 
So again, you will see a pattern in the negative ads of someone associated with Lisa said this, and I think it's important to look at our actual campaign plans and statements. I don't think that Proposition 1 is a solution. I think that people will vote for it because they are frustrated and because we have failed to provide uh, another path forward. And there is another path forward. There are things that work in other communities. There are ways that you can do street outreach, move people into emergency housing, uh, give them uh, options of services. Mental health is one of the key ones, and we are lacking. We don't have a youth detox unit. We need another crisis stabilization unit, as you heard Commissioner Jordan say last week. We need behavioral health. Um, it's been estimated that maybe as many as a third of the unhoused population is severely mentally ill. So they aren't making good decisions for themselves, and uh, we have to be able to do the appropriate outreach to get them into the services that will really improve their lives and improve the safety of our community. And we need to create more spaces for people to be, and I believe we can do that. I will work with neighborhood councils and the city council and nonprofits. I believe they will come together, and the faith community. The churches have told me, we want to be part of the solution. I think they will come together, and I think we can do this, Spokane. Listen, I, I support Prop 1. Um, I think it will be passed overwhelmingly. Um, we have spaces for people, but we have a large portion of the population that doesn't want to go anywhere. They want to live life lawlessness, lawlessly. They are deep in their addiction. We have an addiction crisis in our city and in our state because, remember, we decriminalized drugs for two years. The state of Washington now leads the nation in the increased percentage of overdose deaths. 3,000 people died of overdoses last year. What are we going to do about that? We need to be able to have tougher boundaries to get people into treatment because there are a lot of people who don't want a shelter, who don't want access to services. They just want to do drugs. And we have to have accountability in our programs to do that, not offer them more places to live in their cars in your neighborhood or in encampments in your neighborhood. And now the question from Lisa to the mayor. Your administration closed the Cannon Street shelter, which the city owns, and leased a warehouse on Trent owned by Larry Stone. The total cost of operating it this year is $13 million, and city funds are being used to put in basic sanitation facilities and capital improvements. There is currently no operator chosen or funding stream identified for this facility for the next year. How many people have transitioned from track to housing? What's your plan to fund and operate it over the next four years? And was leasing it a mistake? Um, that was a good decision. Like I said, we have hundreds of people there every single night who are off the street and getting resources. We didn't have the money to pay $5 million plus for that facility, so leasing it seemed to be the better option. Uh, we do have a suggested operator for next year. That process is still going through, so I'm not going to name who it is. We have identified funding through half of next year that we're talking to council about. Um, we are adding infrastructure because we've had a lot of uh, criticism about portable showers and honey buckets, uh, which Camp Hope had. Nobody seemed to have that. That wasn't a problem. But at our shelter, uh, at TRAC, we do. And so, yes, we are increasing some of the infrastructure so that we can have better facilities. And let me just tell you, if somebody's going to buy a warehouse, they don't need 12 bathrooms. That's not going to improve their property. They're probably going to tear them out anyway. But we found a way that we could lower our cost on an annual basis by not having to pay for portable showers and restrooms. And um, it's working. It's working. People are moving out. We have housed more people at TRAC and, and, and helped them through the system and got them to permanent housing than $25 million of commerce money did at Camp Hope. I'll use my wild card then, and unless you think I already used it that one time. <laughs> you have, and I think you're, we're, we're moving on. Okay. Uh, Lisa, you've stated publicly if elected you would remove Brian Coddington from his position with the city. Since you were comfortable with making that statement, what are your thoughts on retaining Christopher Wright, who's the husband of City Council Member Karen Stratton, and resigned from the state in lieu of discipline for misconduct? Do you see any conflicts with this? Um, no, I don't. Okay, thank you. That will save us time. Do, uh, do I get to... Please, go ahead. Yeah. Um, 
Let me just tell you uh, how arrogant I thought it was of my challenger to talk about who she was going to fire if she's elected when she walks through that door. She is hosting an event tonight with a governor called Toast to Change because she's already celebrating her victory as mayor. Um, she not only said she was going to fire Brian Coddington, she was going to fire my CFO, Tonya Wallace. The impact that statements like that from career politicians have on an organization and the morale of staff is so unfortunate. Um, the disrespect and unprofessionalism of a career politician talking like that is so, so disgusting to me. I just have to say that. Okay. <clears throat> Mayor Woodward, let's see. While we hear about the police department, fire department, and significant issues related to homelessness, what opportunities do you see for small investments that would improve the city's service to all the citizens in Spokane, not just those in crisis? Well, our, our uh, first responders, fire, fire and police are doing an amazing job out on the street. They certainly did during COVID. They were the heroes um, of our city in addition to the healthcare system. Um, and, and they are doing, uh, providing the services that they need to. I'll tell you what though, we need more police officers. Uh, we have police overtime skyrocketing because we are understaffed. In fact, the state of, we talked about the state of Washington being the highest in overdose deaths. It's also the lowest even below the D District of Columbia when it comes to how it staffs its law enforcement. We need more officers. The city needs 100 more officers just to meet the national average of where we, sh we should be for a population or a city our size. Um, we spend more than 60% of our general fund on, on first responders, on fire and police. But we do need more officers. We need officers to be able to do the job that they signed up to do. Um, there will be conversations that Lisa may bring up about response times. But police reform measures that were passed in 20, the 2021 legislature took all kinds of tools away from them, including how they respond to calls. So back in the day, we could have one officer go to the scene of a crime, and it's, it was resolved within an hour or two hours. Now we have three to four officers required to go and stay there for hours because of de-escalation training, which de-escalation training is great, but it has handcuffed the way that our officers can even respond to calls. We need common sense policies, and let the police determine what those policies are, not anti-police activists. Uh, the mayor announced a new staffing plan in January and took away neighborhood resource officers. It's the number one thing I hear about from neighborhoods. They want the neighborhood resource officers back, and I will bring them back. And good leadership is about making decisions, even when they're unpopular, and giving a reason why you make them. So, for example, the communication has not been good uh, with transparency about statistics and with city and with city council, despite a million dollar communication budget. So I think we do need a new communications director. The budget director said there was a surplus and a month later said there was an $8 million deficit, um, not setting us up well for next year. I do think we need a new budget director as well. And I do support our police and first responders. I'm proud to have the support of the firefighters union because of my record in public safety. Lisa, do you believe that Leitao Valley can support additional growth? Do you support a moratorium on new growth there until resources are in place to safely allow more growth? Leitao Valley can probably support additional growth, but not yet. There is serious danger of fire occurring there, and there's not a way to get out an appropriate fire station there. Uh, we, unfortunately, preceding this mayor, I'm not blaming this on her, preceding her, but she hasn't fixed it either, there has been um, development without infrastructure. And the city has got to turn that around. We need to do infrastructure first or put housing where there already is infrastructure. And so until we get a plan in place, there's no school, there's no park, there's no library, there's no community center, 3,000 more homes permitted. That's not what a Spokane neighborhood is supposed to be like, right? Our neighborhoods have parks and schools and fire stations and infrastructure. And that's what I'm standing up for with respect to Leitong Valley and Five Mile. And it might make some of the developers who are financing my opponent a little bit unhappy, but let's get the infrastructure in place before the development. 
Well, let me remind everybody, we do have a housing crisis. Uh, during 2021 and 22, we were the fastest growing state, a city or county in the state. Um, and we saw prices astronomically go up because supply has been short and it's been short for a very long time. We need builders to be able to build. I don't support the moratorium, but what I do support <clears throat> is helping neighborhoods uh, in increase infrastructure. They're not going to get infrastructure unless there's building. They're, they're not going to get infrastructure unless there's growth. We at the city have been working on that issue, despite what my challenger said. We have worked on traffic impact fees, bringing them up to, to where they should be for our city. The general, uh, the, the, the GFCs as well. All of those are being updated. Those hadn't been updated in 20 years. And we weren't going to do it in one year, but we have a phased-in uh, approach, and we are working on the issue. Do you favor or oppose charter schools? Why or why not? I support choice in education. Absolutely. I support our public schools, our hardworking teachers. The most influential person in my life was a teacher. Um, my husband was adopted by his first grade teacher after being in the foster care program. I have a special place in my heart for teachers, for education. I think, I think parents need choice. And I support all of the choices that we have in our community, where it's, whether it's public, private, charter. I think parents should decide what is best for their children. And we have a great education system in Spokane and in, and, uh, in Spokane County. We are, we are blessed. Um, my kids went to both. Uh, my, my son went to public. And they went to private. Uh, so I've seen both of it. And we have, we have a great educational system. I support all of it, and for sure, I support choice and education for families. Uh, I support the current framework that we have in Washington State, which is that public schools can create alternative uh, learning environments for students, and they're doing a great job of it. Public Montessori School, public Spanish immersion in, in Spokane Public Schools. Uh, so I think the current framework is good. It's working well. It does give parents choice. And I don't think we need to alter it by opening up the system completely and undermining public education uh, with, with an additional uh, private choice that would have public funding going to it. The arts are an important part of our community. What would you do to support the arts as mayor? I'm really excited uh, about the creative economy and have already done some exciting things in that regard with respect to the film and movie tax incentive and oh, we have a million dollar uh, project that's happening right now because of that incentive. I also would like to see uh, studios and housing for creatives downtown. What if we were able to award almost like a grant the ability to live and work downtown and have your music studio or your art studio there? I think that's a proposal that we could get off the ground with the public sector, with our, our good uh, Spokane Arts community, and with private support. And it would help uh, activate downtown as well as uh, it would help uh, address the additional economic activity that we want to have happening downtown. Well, I'll just tell you, I love the arts. I taught art in my children's elementary school because they didn't have anyone teaching art. It was the parents who created the program and taught the, the, the classes. Um, I, my children are both very, very artistic, and so we've always supported and, and uh, helped them thrive in their, in their skill set in that. I, there's so many applications for arts in the community. Art therapy is a huge one. Uh, I am a huge supporter of that. Creating spaces, public spaces, activating spaces so we can engage more in our uh, artistic community is something that I support as well. We have a thriving arts community here, and, and our, our city council and the administration has supported using ARPA funds uh, to help them during the pandemic because I know the art community was very much impacted. Huge supporter of arts. What are your concerns or how much do you or how do you feel about what's going on in education in our in our city and in our area? Are you are the excuse me, let me rewind here. Education is a significant piece of this city. 
what work is being done there and what are you doing as mayor to help support education? Well, education obviously is extremely important and we at the city used $5 million of our ARPA funds to seed a project called Launch Northwest and it is an innovative program. It's been used in other cities across the country as an economic tool as well as supporting education and that is to guarantee post-secondary education for any uh, family or a student coming from a family that cannot afford college. And that might be a second uh, two-year degree, that might be a four-year degree, it could be a trade. Uh, but we are at the point now where we've raised enough money through that entity to now in 2024 start guaranteeing post-secondary education for uh, people in our, in our community in Eastern Washington. I think education is what opens up the world and opportunities to people, uh, and we need to be able to support it at every level possible. Uh, yes, education. I was just at a Gonzaga uh, classroom yesterday and I'm proud to have uh, been associated with both Gonzaga Eastern and WSU. As I said before, I think the next piece we need to take on in Spokane is pre-K and getting our kids ready for kindergarten. 35% of our girls and only 25% of our boys um, make the six criteria that, that the teachers count as kindergarten ready. I think we can work with the school districts and the child care providers and we can bring in more state resources through the Working Connections Child Care Program, which I help sponsor in Olympia, and we can actually make a difference for those very youngest learners. I think public health is also part of giving them the, the resources they need and that will benefit us, benefit us for generations to come. What's your vision for the city? My vision for Spokane is, uh, I think, the one that this, this community has created. Um, Spokane is an active place. Spokane is a caring place. Spokane is a place with strong neighborhoods. It's got amazing events that people come together around. It's got a serious couple of challenges that we need to take on. And that vision that I have is that we would come together find common ground, stop framing the, the problems on one side or the other, get people in a room and make plans and go forward together. And there just hasn't been that kind of common ground finding the last four years. So we haven't made good progress on those key issues, but I think that we can. And I, as I said before, I think with the anniversary of Expo 74, it's the perfect time to also launch a new initiative that could be transformative. And I think having all of our kids kindergarten ready or a much higher percentage of them currently where we lag the state by 10 points is something that would be really important for this community and something we could all uh, join together around. And I could answer that. My, my, my vision for Spokane is um, not to let it become like failing cities up and down the West Coast. Um, we are independent, we are resilient, we are gritty, we will find ways to address issues our way, not the West Side way. We have a thriving downtown, we have a thriving city, and we want to keep our identity. I don't want Spokane to become like Seattle or Portland or San Francisco. I want to support our businesses. I want safe places for families to raise their children. That's why I stayed when I moved here 33 years ago, raised my kids. Um, they're all grown up now, but we need to keep Spokane strong and thriving and keep it Spokane. What do you think the city should do to address the problem of climate control? Oh, is that my, yeah, my oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, climate control. So the city of Spokane is, is quite innovative when it comes to uh, environmental policy. Our CSO tanks, thankfully, under our former Mayor David Condon, $300 million project that keeps our Spokane River, our number one natural resource, clean. Our rivers never look better. We've spent, we've invested a lot of money uh, doing that. Uh, we are also looking at ways that we can be more um, environmental at the city level. 
Sometimes that can be extremely challenging. We've just changed the way that we can even in, uh, replace our fleet because there's a move to electrify everything, but we're not quite there yet. Um, <laughs> we can't even get electric vehicles. Uh, but we are finding ways to reduce the carbon footprint um, in our city, in our personal organization. I'll tell you one thing that does concern me is um, because we have a housing crisis and because Eastern Washington, we have such a, a regulatory environment. A lot of the housing projects are not going, are not staying here. They're going to North Idaho. And we're creating a carbon issue with all the commuters now on I-90 who are living in North Idaho but living in Spokane or working in Spokane or operating businesses in Spokane. And we need to think about those things as we're driving housing out of our neighborhoods, out of our city, and to other states and the type of impact that that's creating. Uh, climate change is real, and Spokane should be a leader. Um, I invite my uh, opponent to come to the Gonzaga Climate Forum. Uh, we need to expand our tree canopy. Uh, I'd like to work on a pilot project with uh, Vista to create more opportunities for our low-income families to get energy efficiency that would save on energy as well as on their bills. Uh, we need to build out our bike pedestrian and the second corridor of the central uh, city line. The sustainability action plan needs to be uh, given the charge of coming up with two or three actionable things that we can get done in the next four years. And I would be happy to meet with them and figure out how we can move forward on those things. Our young people really want to see Spokane be a leader in this arena. And that's why I'm going to the Gonzaga Climate Forum. Uh, this will be the second to last question. Um, how would you handle a budget deficit or financial crisis? There's been a lot of talk about that coming up potentially, and things are the way, thing, the way things are moving. So, your thoughts? Make no mistake, there is a budget deficit. There is eight million this year uh, for three years. Uh, millions of dollars have been overspent from the budget that the mayor originally proposed, and one-time money was used to fill the gap. Consequently, a $28 million uh, unallocated reserve fund has practically disappeared, and the projected deficit for next year is over $20 million. So I'm calling on the mayor to put forward a plan for how that budget will get balanced next year and put it forward before the election. In in fact, by the time the ballots drop would be a good time for people to understand the plan for next year. The way I take on a budget is a lot of transparency with the public, which we haven't had, so people know what's happening. We've got to talk about the levels of service and the collective bargaining contracts and what it will take to fund them. Uh, our uh, Spokane families can't take uh, tax increases right now. They don't want utility rate increases, and so we've got to bring in more federal and state resources, and we've got to bring in, frankly, the business community and neighborhood leaders and look at our levels of service and figure out where we can uh, make a change because everybody will tell you if your revenues are growing by 3% but your expenses are growing by 5%, that is a structural deficit. And the sooner you take it on, the better it will be. We have a budget, uh, a structural gap. Yes, we do. Just like cities across the state, we are not unique. It's because of inflation. The cost of doing business costs more. Our revenues have not kept up with expenditures. And that's what a lot of people are experiencing. We have had public engagement. We had three town halls, one in each council district. We will present a balanced budget. It's required by law, and we'll do it before the election. Lisa doesn't understand the council, the budget process at council, at, in the city, but that's exactly what we're going to be able to do. She'll say that it's mismanagement uh, of the budget. This is, this is the way it, it is right now. Inflation has a huge impact. What she won't tell you about is the fact that she had funding gaps, that she, in commerce, had, was deficient in over half a billion dollars in COVID spending and, uh, and rental assistance spending. Her audit found that she had deficiencies while the state or the city of Spokane has received, penalty? Has received uh, clean audits the last two years and a, and a national budget award. Sorry, no, she he, doesn't get a rebuttal. Oh, he, wild card? No. He uh, waved the red flag quite a while ago. Yeah. I'm so. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just like, had to finish that long last sentence. I feel like no. I deserve a rebuttal. Go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, 
the budget deficit has uh, is something you try to plan for in advance. Again, that has been with $80 million of federal uh, uh, relief for the city, still this budget deficit is facing us, and we have not been appropriately prepared for it. And um, as a leader of the city, <laughs> I will bring people together, be transparent about it, and we will make some positive uh, not only a positive uh, balanced budget, but replenish the reserve funds that are millions of dollars um, underspent. We still have one of the best bond ratings that any city can have. Nothing has been impacted the way Lisa makes it sound. We're going to be fine. You know, at one point I was thinking that the last question would be <laughs> say something nice about your opponent. I, I think that ship has sailed. So oh, no. instead we'll go, we'll go directly to the mayor and she, for her closing statement. Thank you, Gary. I, Lisa loves dogs and so do I. So there you go. Um, voters have a very big decision this, this election. Um, and there are two very different paths for how we are going to be as a city, what our, future, our city's future is. Um, one path, mine, is to bring people together as I have in the first four years of my term, my first term. One that elevates our law enforcement, listens to voters, and gets to work to accomplish great things for our city. The other path is a very different one. It's Lisa's path. It looks, just look at her record in Olympia, tax and spend policies that were out of control, even suing the voters to raise their taxes, dangerous homeless policies that don't have accountability built into them, like the bungling of Camp Hope, and now she's proposing homeless encampments and parking lots. Even worse, look at who supports her and who she supports. She's funded by anti-police activists and defund the police, endorsed and attended an event by a convicted attempted killer, and at Commerce, she gave $50,000 in taxpayer money to a convicted attempted murderer who then went on to strangle his girlfriend in front of her children. That should scare the you-know-what out of all of us. I'm fighting to bring Spokane into the future, not backwards. I'm proud of my record and accomplishments in homelessness, housing, economic development, and public safety. And I want to continue my work to make sure that crime is illegal again, and despite the reckless policies coming from Olympia and our city council. Thank you again, fellow Rotarians, for hosting the debate. The next mayor of Spokane should be the woman who can best bring people and organizations together with resources to get things done. I've spent 30 years doing that in partnership with people and nonprofits and businesses, and the results are evident across the state and here in Spokane. From the Working Families Tax Credit that people can apply for right now, to classrooms and research labs in the University District, uh, to the funding of AHANA, our multi-ethnic uh, business coalition. In contrast, my opponent has struggled to form effective partnerships, made poor decisions, and her inexperience has cost us. Despite the fact that she's been strong mayor for four years, she's running on how bad things are, how others are to blame for that, and accusing me of having secret agendas to make things worse. There's a better way. The election should be about vision and plans for the future, and I have good ones for effective coordinated homelessness response, getting new fire stations and infrastructure in Five Mile and Leitaw Valley, bringing in more state resources for affordable housing. You can learn about these things at Lisa Brown for mayor.com and you can join us as an endorser or volunteer or donor and I would be deeply grateful for that. I believe in the people of Spokane. We mostly want the same thing it's for our city and with experienced collaborative leadership we can find some common ground and move forward together. With your vote in, December, in November we will do just that. Thank you. Thank you and that ends the debate portion of our show. Let's give everybody a hand. Thank you.